This content may not be suitable for all ages. Listener discretion is advised. I've ordered home security. I signed up for self-defense classes. I'm purchasing mace and looking into handguns. I don't know what else to do. After she calmed down enough, she told us what had happened in the police car. The car started creeping along behind us soon after we did. So we stopped again, and the car stopped with us. This was when Kira got nervous. From Disturbed Media, join your host, Chad, for true tales of horror, bizarre happenings, and unexplainable events. This is Disturbed. Thanks to Daily Harvest for supporting Disturbed. Daily Harvest has delicious options for any time of day. Breakfast, lunch, dinner, snacks, and desserts are always on hand in your freezer and ready to enjoy. Go to dailyharvest.com disturbed to get up to $40 off your first box. Welcome back in everyone and thanks for joining me. This week, I'm bringing you three true horrifying tales that will give you the chills. So sit back and listen close as we dive into the horror. Now, one thing I want to mention at the top of the show is that if you have your own true terrifying story that you want to share for the podcast, I would love to hear it. Head over to disturbedpodcast.com slash submit to find all the different submission options, and you can even get your voice on the show. You can tell your own experience on our hotline, or even if you just want to drop a quick message, give your first name and where you're listening from, and let me know what you like about the show. I'd love to hear more from you guys. You can do that over at disturbedpodcast.com slash hotline, and record right from your mobile device. Your message just might make it onto an episode, so don't wait around. Now then, let's get going. We open the show hearing from Reddit user SignificantOlive3289, featuring voice work by Tanya E.B., and we realize we might not be safe even at work. I need help breaking this down, and I need to feel like I'm not crazy. I'm a court clerk. I work for my local courthouse. I work in the clerk of courts. COC, both in the office and in court, split about half-half time-wise. On Friday, 2-4-22, I was in the office at my desk. I also will assist with customers who come into our office who have questions on certain types of filings. I am the backup coverage specifically for our records window. In my state, we are considered public records. Anyone can come in and request copies from any case, unless it is juvenile, confidential, or sealed by the court. This is really important to the whole story. I was asked to cover the records desk from 4 to 4.30 p.m. last Friday, so our records clerk could leave a little early. No problem. I have no issues helping out when I can. Around 4.15, we had a frequent flyer, as we have so dubbed them. This man comes in frequently to get copies out of his case. I should really note the way my office is set up. It is a bit important. We are set up kind of like the DMV. You have to come into the main entrance of security, go down a long hallway, and it opens to a lobby. There are elevators straight ahead. The DA's office is to the left, and COC is to the right. You have to open a separate set of doors into our little lobby. There is a counter with windows, and it is an L shape. The records window is around the corner, tucked in the back. There are also three public terminals where any member of the public can use to research cases in my county. So back to the man. We'll call him Joe. Joe has an open family case. He comes in probably once a week to get copies out of his family case, or I don't know what the fuck he's doing. It's really none of my business. He came up to my window somewhere around 4.15 to 4.20 p.m., said he requested some documents. When documents are requested from the public terminals, they go to a queue, which I then go into and select them to print. I went into the queue, glanced at the documents, and asked, Did you have 11 pages? He said yes, so I selected and printed. I wrote him a little slip out with the number of copies and his total owed. 
I gave him the slip, directed him to go back to the window, four to five, cashiers, for payment, and would meet him up there. I went to grab the copies off the printer, which jammed, messed with that for a minute, counted the pages, and took them to the cashier. I then went back to my counter to help the next person in line. Next customer was easy. Her records were prepaid and printed. After the second customer, it was after 4.25 p.m. My coworker, work wife, we'll call her Lynn, asked me if I wanted to go thrifting for clothes at Plato's Closet after work, and my answer was, fuck yes, let's go. Right as we are discussing this, I'm in view of the records window, but not at it. I saw that Joe had returned to my counter. I went up to the counter and asked how I could help him. He stated, you must be new. I'm not new. I've been at my job for almost four years and in the legal field for almost ten. I replied, no, I'm not. How can I help? He then made a comment about a paperweight I was using. It was a gift from my niece, a painted rock from a three-year-old. That's a fancy paperweight you have there. Sir, what can I do for you? You gave me the wrong case. No, sir, I printed off what was in the queue. So you don't need these four pages? I tossed the four pages and then adjusted his slip. Seven pages total. Sent him back to the cashier. At this point, it's 4.30. It's Friday and we are closed. I left and headed to Plato's closet. It took me about 15 minutes to drive over there. I sat in my car for a few minutes, then went inside. I beat Lynn there. I started browsing. She came in a couple minutes later, stating she got caught behind a train. So we start shopping and chatting. For some reason, I looked at the door when it opened. There was Joe. Now, I knew it was Joe because he wears that dumb sock monkey hat. I saw him and got Lynn's attention. Um, are you seeing what I'm seeing? So I pulled Lynn into an aisle and we ducked down. She's short, I'm tall, and I wear heels a lot. I could watch his dumb hat around the store. He immediately went to the back of the store. He looked like he was rubbernecking the whole store. So he goes to the back of the store, grabs a pair of shoes, glances at them, and continues rubbernecking. I continued to watch him as he moved. We moved opposite. We were legitimately hiding behind clothing racks. He moved around the perimeter of the store, continuing to rubberneck, looking for something or someone. So he leaves. We freak out. We check the parking lot to make sure he's gone. We try and shake it off and chalk it up to coincidence. And then I realized we were talking about it, literally in front of him. And Lynn? She's not quiet. She gets scolded on a weekly basis for her loud, carrying voice. I told the cashiers what happened. We ended up leaving like an hour later. The next day, I felt so uneasy about it. I called my boss and told her what happened and told her I was going to call the police. I called the non-emergency number and left a message with dispatch. I got a call from an officer a few hours later and explained what happened. He said to get Joe's name. At this point, I recognized him but didn't know Joe's name offhand. He told me he would call me back on Wednesday when he was back on duty. I got Joe's name and called the officer back on Monday, left a voicemail. Monday was fine. Tuesday I was out of the office, but Wednesday. Joe came back Wednesday. He came at 4.20 to file documents into his case. He took 20 minutes to file two affidavits and a motion. It should have been like a minute. Two, because he needed something notarized. He left, and I had a bad feeling. I called the officer and told him what happened. The officer said if he comes back Thursday to call, and they would come down and talk to him. The PD is across the street from the courthouse. Thursday rolls around. No Joe. Until 4.25. He beelined it for the computer in the corner. I messaged my boss. We had already put into place a safety plan. The sheriff's deputies who work security were notified. Three deputies followed him into my office. I called the PD. Two officers came down. They questioned him. He admitted to being at Plato's closet. He was shopping for his two young daughters, nine and eleven. They don't fit into clothes at Plato's yet. Plato's has a sister store, once upon a child. Those kids don't really fit there either. So he had a receipt in his car for once upon a child for 5.07 p.m. He denied hearing my conversation with Lynn re going to Plato's after work. He stated he left my office at 4.15ish and took his children shopping for clothes. He did not have his children with him at the courthouse or Plato's. He also asked the officer immediately and unprompted, did she call you? He also stated that he believed his ex-wife was setting him up. So because my office is a public office and he has made arguably legitimate reasons to come into my office, there's nothing the officers can do. 
They issued him an oral warning and put him on standby. The kicker is, he could opt into his case electronically, but made a big deal about not being able to opt in a few months ago. We told him if he's having issues, call the court support line and they would be able to remedy the situation. Instead, he chooses to come in and pay $1.25 per page instead of a one-time $20 fee, which apparently he also paid that. If you weren't already freaked out, last year, his roommate filed a restraining order against him, followed by his roommate's girlfriend alleging sexual harassment. I won't go into details, re the family case. Let's just say it's more than messy. He is also filing extremely high-level types of documents for representing himself. To 1122 update. I was in court all day. Come down to my desk around 4.05 p.m. He came in about 4.10 p.m. I left while he was still at my office. What am I supposed to do? The officers can't do anything else. I need another incident outside my office to file a restraining order. I've ordered home security. I signed up for self-defense classes. I'm purchasing mace and looking into handguns. I don't know what else to do. Can't get enough disturbed? We've got you covered on Patreon with monthly bonus episodes, ad-free listening, shoutouts, and more. Visit disturbedpodcast.com slash support. You'll be glad you did. Up next, we hear from Reddit user AzelisIdeal4301, featuring voice work by Sarah Thomas. And we're stuck on a road trip gone wrong. I previously wrote this a few months ago in response to the question, what is your scariest road trip experience? I was in the USAF stationed in Omaha in the late 80s. At the time, I hung with my roommate and another friend. My name is Tracy. My roommate's name was Tracy. The girl we hung out with was named Stacy. When we were together, everyone always thought we were lying and being the silly teenagers we were. We always found it funny. One weekend, we decided to take a road trip to Kansas City, Missouri. We were speeding down the highway, laughing and singing at the top of our lungs. We were happy and having the time of our lives. Stacy was driving, and she had a bit of a lead foot. She must have been going too fast because before long, a state trooper pulled up behind us and turned on his lights. Stacy immediately pulled over. By the time the officer made it to her window, She already had her license and registration in hand and the window down. The officer looked at her and then looked at me and Tracy. He then said, I want you to follow me. Don't try to run off or y'all will go to jail. He then turned, walked back to his car and got in. Needless to say, the three of us were puzzled and talking amongst ourselves, wondering why he just didn't take Stacy's identification and write her a ticket. The officer pulled out slowly and we dropped in behind him and followed him down the road. He drove a few miles, then exited the highway. He drove a little ways and turned onto a dirt road that was surrounded by stalks of corn. We all stopped talking as we became more alarmed. However, being young and scared, and since he was a police officer, we continued to follow him. The officer drove for some time down this dirt road and then pulled into an area that had a big beat up old barn. As he stopped and we stopped behind him, a group of men with shotguns exited the barn. It wasn't until that point that we realized we were in mortal danger and panic set in. The officer walked back to our car and told Stacy to get out and follow him to his car. As she got out, she looked at me and Tracy and there was sheer terror on her face. She followed him to his car and he motioned her to get in on the passenger side. She did. Tracy and I were crying, and as the armed men stood on the side of the car looking at us, we began quietly praying for God to protect the three of us. We prayed that Stacy wasn't being hurt, and somehow they would let us leave. After some minutes, Stacy bolted out of the officer's vehicle, ran back to the car, and jumped in the driver's seat. She was crying hysterically, so of course Tracy and I began crying harder. The officer got out of his vehicle and walked back to our car, this time to Tracy's window as she was in the front passenger seat. He asked, is it true? Are y'all in the Air Force? 
to which Tracy replied, yes, sir. The officer calmly said, get out of here and go back to where y'all came from. I better not see y'all again. As soon as he finished, Stacy turned on the car, whipped it around and sped back down the dirt road. She somehow navigated back to the highway. As she drove back towards the base, the silence was only broken by an occasional sob from one of us. Stacy drove for a while, and as soon as we crossed back over into Nebraska, she pulled over on the side of the highway. Then she began to sob heavily. Tracy and I hugged her and asked if she was hurt in any way. She shook her head no, she wasn't hurt. After she calmed down enough, she told us what had happened in the police car. After she got in the car, she offered the officer her identification and told him she was sorry for speeding. He took her information and then asked her, what are you doing with those two N-words? Stacy was white. She explained that we were on a road trip. He then told her that if she would do certain favors for him, he might let us go with a warning. At that, Stacy had a complete meltdown. I guess while he was waiting for her to calm down, he finally looked at her identification and saw that she had also given him her military ID. He asked her if we were all in the military, and between her sobs, she said we were. He asked where we were stationed, and she told him off at Air Force Base. He then told her to go back to her car. As we sat there, after Stacy told us what occurred, I think it hit all three of us at the same time that the only thing that saved us was that we were in the military and stationed at a nearby base. We hugged each other and cried until we couldn't cry anymore. We didn't report what had happened. Again, we were teenagers and didn't think we would be believed over a law enforcement officer. We never talked about it after that day. That incident has haunted me for years. All of the what ifs. But as I've gotten older, what haunts me more is the thought that others may not have been as lucky as we were. Are you terrified yet? You will be. With so much going on in the world right now, life is just so hectic and chaotic. For me personally, working full-time on Disturbed between planning out episodes, finding new stories, editing, and putting it all together, I can lose track of my time very easily. And when I finally realize it, I don't really have time to cook dinner or I just don't feel like it. I'm sure many of you can relate after a long day of work. But when your fridge is empty, that urge to order in and skip the cooking happens all too often. I know I've been guilty of it at times for sure. But as of recently, that hasn't been an issue and that's because of Daily Harvest. Daily Harvest helps keep my freezer fully stocked with options that are delivered right to my door and are delicious and ready in just minutes. Avoid that takeout temptation and check out Daily Harvest. Now, the thing I love about Daily Harvest is how many great options they really have. They deliver delicious harvest bowls, soups, flatbreads, snacks, smoothies, lattes, and more. And it's all built on organic fruits and vegetables. And you can find tasty options for any time of day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, as well as snacks and desserts. They've got it all covered for you. You always have what you need on hand and ready to enjoy when you want it. Now, I just enjoyed the hazelnut and chocolate little mini bites that they have, and they taste just like a dark chocolate hazelnut truffle. It was fantastic. And let me tell you, I did not feel bad about it because it's a clean option made with healthy ingredients. It really is a great option for someone like me who rarely has time to cook, but can now find a really tasty snack or meal that's quick and easy, and it will still keep you on a healthy track during those busy weeknights. So discover what I've discovered. Avoid the takeout temptation and get Daily Harvest. Go to dailyharvest.com slash disturbed to get up to $40 off your first box. That's dailyharvest.com slash disturbed for up to $40 off your first box. dailyharvest.com slash disturbed. Now back to the horror. Disturbed podcast with your host, Chad. And finally, we close out the show hearing from Reddit user The Neroids of Neptune, featuring voice work by Nicole Doolin. And we never want to drive straight home. This story happened about two years ago when I was 19 and my foster sister Kira was 16. 
For the sake of this story, it's important to know that I was female presenting and hadn't come out as trans yet. Nor was I presenting myself in an overtly masculine style at the time. It was the summer before I was going to college, and I mostly lived with my mom and Kira, except for every other weekend, where I'd stay with my dad. Now, summers where I am can get really hot and humid, so we had a habit of waiting to walk the dogs until 6 or 7 p.m., because that's when it'd be cooler but still light outside. On this particular evening, Mom wasn't going to be home until late, though I don't remember the exact reason why. She's a woman that likes to stay busy and often participates in choirs, Bible studies, youth groups, classes, and more. So it wasn't uncommon for Kira and I to be left home alone until 8 or 9 p.m. So it was up to me and Kira to walk the dogs by ourselves, unless we wanted our younger dog, Samson, to throw tantrums due to pent-up energy. Even though we lived in the countryside and could have walked them down our street, Kira and I decided to drive out 20 minutes to a park instead. Why? I don't remember. It could have been anything from being bored walking our roads to not wanting to have to deal with blind curves and hills. Whatever the reason, at around 7.30 p.m., Kira and I harnessed our two dogs, packed them up in the car, and drove to the park. Let me quickly explain the layout of the park so that it's easier to understand why we got nervous halfway through our walk. This park isn't very big, but it's popular because of its loop. The entire park is surrounded by a mile-long looping road with its attractions, like playgrounds, ponds, and a small country hall, spaced about in the inner side of the loop. The outer side is just grass, trees, and one playground at its end. Thus, it's common and expected to pass people walking the loop at least two times if you're walking in opposite directions, but not if you're walking in the same direction, obviously. Any cars on this road can only drive in one direction because it's a one-way road. At first, everything about this walk was normal. I parked the car, we clipped our dogs to leashes, and we started on the loop. Every so often, we'd stop so I could take pictures of our good boys, particularly of Kira trying to wrangle Samson, who pulls like his life depends on it and weaves around because he wants to smell everything. It was while I was taking one of these pictures that the first encounter happened. A man, who looked to be in his 40s, walked past us, walking the same direction we were, up towards the playground on the outer side of the loop. He smiled at Kira, nodded, said hello, or cute dogs, or something like that, and kept walking. I honestly didn't think anything of it. We're at a park at a time of day where it's common to walk around due to the cooler temperature and people where I am are generally friendly. Smiling and saying hi is pretty normal, no matter who says it. We smiled back, maybe said hi or thanks depending on what he said, and that was that, or so we thought. This man passed us again only 10 minutes later, directly across from where we'd seen him previously. Just like he did before, he smiled and said hi. This time, Kira and I looked at each other once he was ahead of us and shared a, well, that was weird expression. Just ten minutes earlier, he had passed us walking up towards the playground and subsequently broke off from the loop, and he'd been walking in the same direction as us. This time, though, he'd cut in front of us, and he did it in a way where we had to stop to avoid running into him. Hell, he nearly touched Kira with how close he was walking. That was already weird in and of itself. The other weird part was him cutting past us in the opposite direction. The only way he could have done that was if he'd cut across the inside of the loop, since it would have been close to impossible to pass at our certain point from the other direction if he decided to walk the opposite way of the loop than us. It came off almost like he wanted to walk by us again. But just like before, Kira and I brushed this weirdness off. The guy could have been enjoying a rambling stroll and doing his own thing for all we knew. Besides, we had two reasonably sized dogs with us. Who'd mess with us? Not even five minutes later, this same man passed us again. Once again, cutting so close past us that he nearly brushed shoulders with Kira. Again, he smiled and said hi before walking off. 
This was officially the moment I decided we needed to leave. Sure, it's normal to pass a person at least two times walking this loop, if you're going in opposite directions, but doing so takes a while. You have to at least get to the parallel spot on the loop from where your paths first intersected to see each other again. Both the time between running into the guy and the location we passed each other didn't match up in a way that didn't look suspicious. Plus, I really wasn't a fan of how he cut across us. The first time, he passed us like a normal person walking faster than us would, albeit a little close. The second time, he cut in front of us from the opposite direction instead of walking around us, to the point we had to stop to avoid running into him. This third time, he walked up behind us then did this weird, directionally slant walk to cross the street and go in the opposite direction, cutting us off again. I told Kira to hustle so we could get to our car and get out instead of doing a second loop. So that's what we did. When we were almost to our car, we noticed a car creeping along behind us. We pulled to the side and stopped to let it pass, but for a second, it stopped too. We figured he was getting ready to park, so we started walking again. The car started creeping along behind us soon after we did. So we stopped again, and the car stopped with us. This was when Kira got nervous. We hadn't seen the middle-aged guy since the third cutoff, so we figured I had overthought the whole thing. But here we were, with this tinted windowed car acting weird as all hell. Was it the same guy back with his car? A different guy? We couldn't tell. Before anything could happen, though, another car idled up to the one next to us, and whoever it was sped up to the expected five miles per hour. We got to our car pretty fast after that and practically picked up the dogs to get them inside of it. We got in and got out of there. My mistake, however, was neglecting my rear-view mirror, and the well-advised rule not to drive straight home if you're worried a stranger's taken too much interest in you. I was anxious, dumb, and primarily concerned with getting home where we could be safe. Because home is safe, right? Nothing bad is supposed to happen to you there, right? Ah, my naive, false sense of security. I think we got home around eight-something. The sun had finally disappeared behind the horizon, but it wasn't fully dark yet. Just that dusty purple color the sky gets before it finally accepts that it's nighttime. Mom wasn't home yet, so we got the dog some water, locked the doors, ate a late dinner, and chilled in the living room, talking about things that didn't really matter. It was almost 9.30 when the scariest part of this whole ordeal happened. There Kira and I were, sitting on different couches, talking about something or other, when we noticed the ceiling briefly light up over where Kira was sitting. An important note here is that Kira was sitting on a small couch with her back to a window that faces the front of the house, while I was on a couch on the opposite wall where I could see a sliver of the front porch. Likewise, right next to Kira was our front door, which has three small rectangular windows on it. Due to our long, slightly curvy driveway, It's common to see headlights stream through that window, light up the ceiling, fade, then intensify. It means someone's just come home. So when the ceiling above Kira lit up, we thought nothing of it, assuming mom was finally coming back from wherever she went that night. And we didn't take any notice of the light skipping the final arc of someone pulling all the way up the driveway either. We also didn't pay any mind to how long it was taking mom to come inside. Mom has a habit of pulling in, then checking her phone for God knows how long before coming inside. After a couple of minutes, I noticed the small motion sensor light Mom set up on a table on the porch light up. Again, I could only see a sliver of space based on my position and the curtains. Basically, I could see a smidge of the table and the rails bordering our porch, but not its stairs or anything approaching the door, depending on how they approached it. I wasn't paying much attention either because I assumed it was my mom. Right after the light went off, we both heard the storm door open. But we didn't hear anyone pressing the code keys of our lock or jiggling the door handle like mom usually does right away. 
The moment the storm door creaked open, our two dogs jumped up and ran to the door, barking like mad. Our golden greyhound mix Calvin has a deep, scary bark, which contradicts his adorable appearance. Samson, our dumb goofball son, who is incapable of hurting a fly, but a big boy, jumps up on his hind legs and scrambles to find purchase on one of the small windows in a desperate attempt to see who's outside. Immediately, the storm door slammed shut, and we heard heavy footsteps on the cement of our porch. Calvin started going nuts and jumped up on Kira's couch, standing on its back instead of the cushions, to look out the window. Samson ran out of the room and went out the doggy door that leads to the back porch, which has a ramp going down into a fenced-off portion of our yard. I couldn't move. I'd never understood really what it meant when people described their limbs turning to lead until that moment. It felt like I didn't have limbs, really. Like moving wasn't an option. If I moved, I might glimpse something or someone through the windows. The person could see me running around the house, freaking out, and decide to come after us after all. So I sat there, my mind steadily going blank as my heart sped up and limbs refused to move. In the game of fight, flight, or freeze, I'm the freezer. Kira, on the other hand, is a fighter. She spins around and looks out the window but can't see anything because, besides the motion light on the porch, it's too dark. So, naturally, she gets up grabs a stray dog toy, which just so happens to be a tug-of-war rope with a ball on one end, and opens the door. I tell her very calmly to shut the door and stay inside. She ignored me and stepped out onto the porch. She comes back inside after not seeing anything, but to my utter disbelief, she disappears to the kitchen, comes back with a knife, and goes outside again. This time, she's gone for a handful of seconds before running back inside and slamming the door shut. Breathless, she tells me she went out a bit into the yard and saw the outline of a man by the run-down dog kennel we don't use anymore. When she saw him and froze, he moved. This time, she listened to me when I told her to lock the door. I managed to call Mom despite my head being empty and my limbs being led, and she convinced me to get up, make sure all the doors are locked, including the basement, and making sure the dogs were inside. I ended up making Kira go into the fenced-up section to drag Samson back inside because I couldn't get my legs to move after thinking about doing it myself. Cowardly, I know. After Mom got home and looked around, finding nothing, we called the non-emergency number for the police, not wanting to bother them in case we were overreacting. Two cops came by and walked around our yard and found nothing. We got the sense they didn't believe us, but instead saw us as two overexcited girls with exaggerated imaginations. Still, they humored us and told us, after we told them about the park, that if we think anyone might be following us, or if someone's acting a little too creepy, not to drive straight home and to check if anyone's following us. Then they left. To this day, I'm pretty sure the only people who believe someone with malicious intent came to our home in hopes of finding two teenage girls as Kira and me. Though whether or not whoever it was was the guy from the park, we're not sure. But it's too coincidental, isn't it? That the day we have multiple encounters with this guy who goes out of his way to get close to us, and a car inch along behind us, we also have an almost intruder encounter? Plus, there were too many details that didn't add up to us having overly excited imaginations. We both saw headlights. The motion detector on the porch turned on. The storm door opened and stayed open until Samson jumped up to look out the door's window. It's a very noisy door and makes sounds when opening and closing. We heard footsteps. Kira saw someone. And the dogs don't run up to the door like that and bark their heads off if no one's there. I don't know if whoever was at our house was the same guy that ran into us at the park. If it was, I don't know if the reason he cut in front of us as close as he did was to test how our dogs would react to him, and them not caring at all, or the first time wagging their tails convinced him that they weren't a threat. I don't know if he was in the car that inched behind us and stopped when we stopped. I don't know what would have happened if Calvin didn't have a scary, manic bark, or if Samson wasn't tall enough to look out the high windows on the door. I don't know much of anything. 
What I do know is this. If you're out and about minding your own business and a stranger is taking a lot of notice of you, following you, frequently running into you or whatever, trust your gut. Don't drive or walk straight home. Meander. Get to a public space. Or just take your time. Pay attention to your surroundings. You never know who is watching you. Follow our social channels on Facebook and Instagram at Disturbed Podcast and on Twitter at Disturbed underscore pod. Don't forget to head over to disturbedpodcast.com slash submit to send in your own true terrifying tale. Disturbed is produced by yours truly, funded through advertising and your support. And if you'd like to support the show, you can get early access to our premium feed, featuring ad-free listening and bonus episodes. Visit patreon.com slash disturbedpodcast to learn more. And let's shout out our newest supporters. Vita Kennedy, Kayla and Chad Lawson, Carmen San Diego, and Sarah Moore. They all get instant access to our catalog of bonus episodes, ad-free listening, and 24-hour early episode releases, and you can too, over at patreon.com slash disturbedpodcast. Music by Carl Casey at whitebataudio, co.ag, and Kevin Hartnell. Thanks for listening. We'll be back next Thursday with a brand new episode. And stay safe out there, y'all. <laughs>